E para mediar essa conversa, convido agora a Brett Demand, que é pesquisadora e consultora de inovação da Faculdade de Engenharia da Universidade do Porto. So good afternoon also from my part, uh, as told. Uh, we are three here on the stage now, and we'll use the time that has remained until four o'clock uh, to briefly synthesize um, uh, the both of the presentations of Glenn and, and Leonardo, which are very, were rather different, and at the same time also they had similarities, but like still rather different. So try to find a, not a common place, but, um, but to, yeah, make uh, key key takeaways of that, and um, and then also perhaps speak up on the survey that has been briefly mentioned yesterday, which a uh, global soft power index by uh, by one association in the UK, which is the perhaps the biggest soft power surveys uh, concluded in the world, and just helps as a as a base point. Yeah. Um, so I'll start off perhaps with, um, with just briefly telling that uh, the five key the five key areas uh, of the application of soft power so as then as a goal as Leonardo was brief, uh, very not briefly but rather extensively I will tell referring is the talent attraction so there are, according to this uh, global soft power index which was also referred yesterday. Uh, the five key areas of the application of soft power could be, at least according to this one survey, which is clearly not the only one in the world, uh, is tourism, trade, talent, investment, and diplomacy. So our goal here is to focus more on talent and innovation and education in a common pot. Um, so yeah, uh, starting with the uh, presentation of Glenn. Glenn, thank you for the presentation. and. Uh, I know you did not necessarily focus on the states as, as actors, but they, in the end of the day, I think all the, all the decision making still is confined by the limitations of, uh, of states. So um, what would you tell as a, as a, as a founder of a Brussels-based public consultancy firm, Time and Place, um, in Europe, in, within the confined borders of European Union, uh, we presume that we have a common or more or less more or less common interest for innovation and science policy, which we know that at the same time several countries have quite a bit different interest. So what Europe, for instance, in your opinion, uh, needs to do in order to become a um, global lighthouse um, for science and innovation, and then what is perhaps still lacking from the European perspective, uh, for in comparison to China, to the US, to other great, great economies, in terms of putting research and transferring research more rapidly to businesses and, uh, and um, bringing in this, um, this aspect. That is, what can we do in, the Euro in Europe uh, holistically to be perhaps more um, to be stronger in putting research into into businesses. Yep. To be, to be more internationally competitive. Um, exactly. Um, so first of all, if I may just say, there was a great presentation, Leonardo. I just wouldn't have not put the temperature up there. I think you lost half the crowd. <laughs> no, but really, uh, there were a lot of synergies between us, and I'm I'm, I'm super happy that we we uh, went for for the same terminology of uh, of empowerment and um, and empathy. And I think these are also um, parts of, of, of the answer of what, what, you're, what you're asking. Um, 
You see, I'm, I'm half German, half Romanian, so there are two very different experiences. And what the European Union has done um, and really cared about is try to fill the gaps across um, the continent, so to say. And not only in the continent itself, but also on the, uh, in the neighborhood. Now, the contexts are completely different. I mean, we have seen countries uh, like Estonia, who sprung up from a post-communist time, um, who have gone a certain path of digitalization and have had extraordinary success. So I have every, every kudos to, to Estonia and what Leonardo represents. You have countries like Germany that have focused very much on, a, uh, on an industry-based approach, have forgotten to invest in education, have forgotten to really keep in a lot of the Euro or German companies inside of Europe that have moved all across the globe just because of various different contexts that are permissive and are much more attractive. And I can also mention about the Romanian experience. I mean, once the doors were open, communism had fallen. Um, you had the biggest brain drain one can imagine. I think it was something of uh, 23 million turned to 17.5 million in population. And what is happening in the European Union right now has various degrees of success. I cannot say that one country is better than another country in doing something. Um, of course, there are various levels of governance, but there's, what is happening is that there's a, a stronger um, implication at the local level. So to take Romania, for example, there is an influx now of um, a young generation that has gone abroad to study but have not stayed abroad, they've come home. And they've come home because there are job opportunities, professional opportunities, and so on and so forth, um, that allow them also to be at home, so to say. I mean, as being half Romanian, we're very homely people, so to say. Uh, we, we care about family, maybe uh, to a certain degree differently more than, than other more Western Hemisphere countries, but uh, that's more a, more a philosophical question. Um, but what you see in Romania happening is that there are some regions that are highly developed. So if you look at the Transylvanian area in the north, the connection with Hungary, the highways that have been constructed, um, connecting also Hungarian-speaking minorities in Romania much better to, uh, to Hungary and also the rest of Europe, Hungary, Austria, having a very strong tradition, of course. Um, whereas in the south, where the capital is, Bucharest, they've not been able to construct a highway to the north. There are certain parts that are constructed and also to the east towards the harbor in Constanza, but apart from that, there's been a lack of ability to connect the country and efficiently implement um, the financial um, opportunities that the European Union provides. So maybe just to sum up in two or three points, um, when you look at the European Union, you cannot look at individual countries anymore ne necessarily or strictly. Um, second of all, uh, when you take into context everything, or, or take into to account everything that I've said, what the European Union has been able to do is bring people together to look at the variety and diversity. Also, I have to say I'm a little bit worried about the European Parliament elections next year and the kind of um, divergencies that are happening. Um, and third of all, it is such an ambitious project. I mean, um, the European Union is the most, let's say at least by law and by ambition, most integrated economic area. And it's not only about economics. It's not only about having a joint or past history that is, uh, that is something in common. You have so many, I mean, you speak seven different dialects just within, uh, at least it feels like it within the area of Amsterdam, <laughs> to be honest. But really what, what the European project is, is it's a highly ambitious program. And I think because of that ambition, um, it is important not to let go, even though in the face of international competition, it makes it a little bit more difficult. But there are hubs, like I said, in Amsterdam, I'm naming one now, um, or in, in the Transylvanian area in Romania that are highly attractive, or of course, Estonia, not to be forgotten. Sorry for my long answer, but again, I, I throw. Yeah. yeah, and uh, just to just to comment, maybe a bit more. Like uh, I think uh, I, I like this uh, word that uh, it's in Portuguese. Uh, that uh, yesterday was mentioned when, you know, they they show this pool behind the pickup truck. Like uh, what was this word, the for for this uh, kind of very creative uh, solutions that. 
Yeah, that one. Yeah. So and in, 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 in Spanish uh, from Mexico, we also have like this Mexicanadas, like it's kind of like a similar like, word. And I, and I think that uh, in that sense, that is one of the things that uh, if we're talking about innovation, that the European Union might actually uh, stay behind, right? Because uh, it is an advanced uh, region. Uh, it had uh, had its major successes. And then once you have your major successes, once you have done like, you know, reach some sort of comfortability, then you really don't have that much need to innovate, right? Like, whether, you, whether if you have many problems, if you have like challenges, then you are like thinking, you know, I cannot sit down and, you know, staying like this, but then you start constantly thinking about what are gonna be the challenges. So perhaps this kind of like, when we talk about collaboration and we talk about innovation, then bringing those problems like uh, either closer to the European Union to create that sense of urgency to create more innovation or vice versa, bring those people that you have in the European Union and let them see what other problems are there that are still yet to be, you know, like solved. So I think uh, staying kind of, yes, in this like uh, uh, comfortability of the successes is one of the things that maybe the European Union should focus on not doing in order to continue that innovation trial. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, perhaps a quick remark also that we, uh, since Leonardo and Glenn didn't answer any questions at the end of their panels, we'll leave uh, time for uh, questions at the end of uh, this panel session. Um, thank you both for the answers uh, or like your thoughts on it. Uh, was not a <laughs> one-on-one -on -one answer <laughs> situation. But uh, so my next question would be uh, to Leonardo uh, firstly, but also to Glenn, but primarily Leonardo since it involves uh, talent attraction. Um, we heard about Estonia, um, and now Estonia, as you told, and we don't want to also focus on one little country in Europe, and for the colleagues that are from Brazil, uh, in general focus on the European, um, European area, European Union as such. Um, Estonia is in a region uh, surrounded by other mid-sized countries, small and mid-sized countries. So um, Denmark, Norway, and Norway is a bit further, but Sweden, Finland, we also have other Baltic neighbors, that's like Lithuania, we have Poland. So all of them are in the global run, as you tell it, for the, for the best and the brightest. Um, what is Estonia doing differently in a sense of how do you, how do you keep up the competition and, uh, and taking or picking up from your yesterday's workshop um, how we can turn this competition regionally, and it applies to any other region, how you can turn this competition into collaboration that it would be a win-win situation. So how it is happening in the region, how do, you keep, how do you keep the competition getting too tough so that everyone would win? And the same logic applies to any other region that compete for the best and the brightest. Yes, uh, so it's uh, it's very difficult because then, uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer to that, how to do it. I, I know, like, for example, that we bring it closer, but it's uh, everybody wants, like, a piece of the talents, right? So, uh, first of all, like, somebody, like, uh, each and every country has to find its own core values and then working on that value proposition that I mentioned. And once you have the value proposition, then you have just a certain amount of people that maybe can, let's say, fit that description, right? So we don't want everybody, you know, that is working in IT, uh, that is working in engineering to come and over to Estonia. We, we, first of all, we can't fit them all. And then, then second of all, we know that, for example, this uh, shorter temperature, shorter like the days in winter is not for everyone, right? So you have to find that specific target audience that you want and then working on that, uh, on those. And even though we all want ICT people, then perhaps some of them like nature more, then uh, it will be better for them to work. Some of them like bigger metropolis, bigger cities, then perhaps uh, Sweden, Denmark will be better for them. So there are like different nuances, and then finding these nuances within those target audiences is one of the things that we can do. Now, when we're talking about this region, for example, uh, uh, Sweden, Denmark, uh, we, all, we all want ICT uh, engineers. But perhaps uh, when people go and try it over there, they don't like it, they want to move away, then uh, why not sending them over to the next country that is you know, right there, to the same region, for the region to win? So maybe that's one of the things uh, uh, that we have been doing. Uh, there is a group of uh, practitioners uh, from uh, different countries in Europe, which is we created the Talent Mobility Forum, and that's one of the things. Even though we are competing for the same talents, we have created a network to exchange best practices. And then when we talk about, you know, like, I want to go somewhere, you know, but it's not Sweden, then the Swedish person will say, oh, but have you thought about Estonia, for example? And then we have created perhaps like uh, ideas of 
why not run a campaign that will attract people to the North Tech Valley, let's say, or to uh, Northern Europe? Because, for example, in a, a, it's more uh, less competitive, let's say, than uh, other regions or countries as the US, Australia, the UK, right? So why not join efforts in order to become or posi position ourselves in the same level as these other bigger countries? And so those are the little things that we have been doing. But uh, definitely, I would say that uh, the shift has been happening already, that it's not only about uh, competition, but it's also about this collaboration and how to find this win-win sensation. And there's always, most, most of the time, there's always a way that there can be value created for competitors. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Glenn, from the Central European, or more in the center, Western Central European point of view. Do you, do you have any like uh, good examples of like collaboration in attraction of, uh, of of talents to Europe or like what does your consult consultancy perhaps do anything in in this respect or like you have any 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 any, any input in that? Um, with regards to individual projects, I mean. Yeah, well, that, to be honest with you, I, I, I can't <laughs> number them up now, but I can tell you as you, as you asked what we're, we're working on right now. Um, I, I started working in Brussels about 16 years ago, and I noticed that there was very much a lack of um, a bit of a offer or resources for people to go to to understand what their opportunities really are when it came to public affairs, so government relations, communications, advertisement, so essentially humanities, social studies. And uh, the reason being is that a lot of times these kind of humanities and social studies areas seem to not be that attractive for, um, for job markets to focus on in terms of, of the resources to put in. Maybe because it's so diverse, volatile, in terms of what degrees you need. Um, and so, for me, 16 years ago, I decided to do one thing, and it's always been stuck in the back of my mind, to find a solution, um, actually basically an app. So this is a state secret, of course, or a commercial secret, so to say, uh, to develop an app and, uh, and a website that focuses specifically on these disciplines, or disciplines, um, looks at uh, the various languages, various locations, and just facilitates the search. I mean, people talk about LinkedIn, but LinkedIn has been kidnapped into a social media platform. And what happens, and this is one of the main principles we're looking for in this product, is that there are very small organizations or companies like legal offices which have like one or two uh, employees. So the resources are limited, um, or the interest is not there, or they're somewhere in the middle of nowhere when somebody would say, well, could, could be said. So the idea is to essentially democratize the access to the various job markets based on just very simple principles and easy access and facilitation. Um, and it, the strategy essentially is based on the fact that we see there to be a lack of offer and the lack of uh, attention to that area. And I'd, I'd like to change that for, for those that are essentially look following my footsteps, if you want to say that. Thank, thank you both. Uh, so let's uh, move on to very subjective uh, question. It's also about your opinions and no, uh, no, no straightforward truth, how it is or it's not. So what about um, your opinions on, for instance, uh, Denmark, like in Europe, Denmark as a country is almost, uh, almost e like very often equalized as a, as a country. Uh, country related to uh, wind energy. So its main company uh, that is also present in Portugal, uh, where I'm working and living, Vestas, is like, uh, can have a very good effect or have very good uh, results from this um, knowledge of Denmark as a great wind energy country. And uh, therefore is known as such, the Denmark as country uses its reputation its reputational soft power as known as a sustainab uh, sustainable wind energy related key flag flagship country in Europe, let's say like that. So are there, um, could Europe as such be also known for as a hub, as a, as a front runner for in the world, let's say like that, as a region for innovation in sustainable technology, not just in energy sector, but in but in health, in bio, bio products, um, etc. 
just on your very subjective thoughts, um, is, could we become the flagship of that? Yeah, the very short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, definitely, I mean, the, well, kind of like the sky is the limit, right? Everywhere, like uh, overall, like I, I stay positive with everything. And then I agree yesterday also with one of the uh, persons who was speaking that uh, we have to change the narrative to a more positive tone, right? And then, uh, yes, we can become this. But then again, uh, when we were talking about uh, uh, different things, you know, you're trying to create an image of, uh, you know, uh, being an innovation hub, let's say then you need, in order to do that, then you actually have to deal with innovation. You have to create solutions. You have to uh, develop products that are innovative. And you have to look at problems like uh, in an innovative matter. So uh, it's not only about building or talking about it, but it's also about doing the stuff. So uh, you have to do this hand in hand. And once you have like an example, then you have to spring it. You know, you have to talk to people about it. You have to showcase it. You have to take it to different uh, areas. So again, like I think for the European Union to be positioned as an innovation hub, then okay, you have to take those innovation hubs that you have within the European Union, and then how do you translate it? How do you extrapolate them into the whole of the European Union? How can you tell them? Uh, and, and not only stay in that, but actually, how do you take them outside so of the European Union in order for other countries, other cities, or regions to be taking the example, and then they don't, they know that ah, you know, like this was made in the European uh, Union, right? So I think this is one of the uh, one of the things that, for example, Estonia did, right? It started exporting its digital solutions for governments in order for other governments to tow, and that's and that's one of the things. And 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 when we talk about uh, digital, let's say uh, one you know thing to say is that you know Estonia perhaps is not the or I think definitely it's not the most innovative country in terms of digital solutions. Uh, what is innovating is that it's taking those digital solutions and make them uh, sustainable and make them like, uh, um, how do you say, like reliable and trustworthy. And that is one of the things that not many countries have, right? 98% of the population, including from the very young to the very old, actually use these digital services. Why? Because they are trustworthy. And that's kind of what we are, right? Uh, we might talk about digital society, but actually what we are doing is uh, we are in the business of creating trust between citizens and governments. And uh, again, trust is very much of a soft power, right? So that's uh, one, one example, but then when uh, the EU identifies what is that we are, we have like the democratic values, uh, we have like freedom of movement, etc. Those things are the things we need to capitalize on, but then we need to find innovative ways to do it. And uh, and your thoughts, Glenn? Because it's a very generic question, you know, like uh, about Europe as such, European Euro European Union. Let's put it like that to be more uh, correct in terms of, uh, our of boundaries, uh, both legislative and uh, and the physical boundaries in European Union. Uh, you see, there are f several facets to the European Union. We're not only talking here about an economic power, which used to be the biggest purchasing power. We're not only talking here about um, a powerhouse which houses the biggest car industries, which is also dwindling. We're also talking here about a social political dynamic. Sorry? Okay. Social political dynamic or socio political dynamic, which is very much in favor of reaching out. The European Union has an extraordinarily complex legislative procedure. And we've seen more and more that the traditional trade deals that we approached in the last one, uh, which we looked at, for example, was uh, Mercosur, or Mercosur for, for the English speakers. Um, um, the ongoing negotiations right now, and I have to say I'm not so sure they're going to succeed, um, to be honest with you. And the last time that uh, it was nearly ratified, um, what happened is that a regional government in, in Belgium, in Wallonia, so the southern part, um, voted against it in their parliament, and so on and so forth. So we have an extraordinarily complex way of governance. This implies a bit of a paradox, 
because, I mean, I'm working, uh, I was, have been working in the EU-US Trade and Technology Council, which is about sharing technology and looking at similar principles. What I was also mentioning before about having the same plug, the same digital communication between the electric vehicle and the charging station. These are the kind of solutions which move ahead with a certain sense of the commission takes um, the lead together with the presidency of the council, so the one member state of the 27 that, that runs the, the council. And the same thing is happening right now with India. And I'm actually pushing for this to happen between the EU and if not Mercosur, then certainly I'd like it to happen uh, with Brazil because it is in something in parallel to the trade deal that does not depend on the other. But these are practical solutions. And the paradox here is these practical solutions are the ones that have always been at the heart, uh, at least based on the principle of what the European Union stands for, is reaching out. So I mean, for me as a business, it's extraordinarily important to look at Belgium, Portugal, Brazil, for obvious reasons. I mean, we're not only talking about language here. Or for me, it's important to look at Belgium, UK, India, also for traditional reasons, even though there are slightly other complexities, of course. So when we look at the European Union and the, the complexity of, of the way it's governed and the difficulties that exist, especially with the upcoming elections, and I cannot repeat that enough actually because I'm really worried, um, is that we're, we're facing a way where we have these ambitions but don't have the governance and technical means to move ahead except on these technology-based approaches. I mean, just to give you again, to come back to the EU US Trade and Technology Council, it's not only about e-mobility and the megawatt charging system, um, it's also about AI, looking for common ground and common principles. So the old or the traditional trade deal doesn't work. I mean, they tried it with India as well. It worked with Vietnam, but that was more to counteract Chinese influence because what the interest was there was uh, to make sure that their uh, Chinese goods entered the European market. But what happened is that, uh, in many cases, I can't generalize now because I might get into trouble, but China used the Vietnamese market to bring their goods to Europe. So, hoorah, uh, that worked well. So, uh, in essence, looking at these value-based, specific technical ambitions to address technologies like AI is the way forward. And I think that is something that we have to strongly take into account because of the complexity of governance in Europe. So the sometimes over not over regulation but the complexity of the of the decision making procedures could be impeding Europe from from Well this being depends on the sector now as well. Okay. There is a lot of over regulation <laughs> as well, some would say. Uh, I would say, uh, in many things, uh, very prescriptive. And uh, actually, now is a good point to come back to your first question. What makes it so difficult to be competitive compared to, to uh, the US or China? I mean, these are completely different philosophies, completely, all three of them. And in the US, the idea is to have the technology go ahead and then see how we can adapt. Of course, damage is happening on the way. I'm not saying that is the correct way to do it. In China, you have a more centralized approach. Nonetheless, there is a lot of, when it comes to e-mobility, uh, a lot of trial and error, um, I can say that. And at the European level, there are these great um, approaches of looking at joint solutions, but very prescriptive. So when we're looking, for example, at the way that e-mobility is pushed, and this is more a philosophical question, it has to be based on that technology, which can be good, but then going and saying it needs a card payment terminal and rather letting a business decide if it needs a card payment terminal or not um, because a business would know that it wants to attract the customer. But then these are the things that really inhibit progress because the cons discussions stop at those places. Yeah, no, I mean, I was, I want to agree with uh, what uh, Brett said, actually, like, uh, overall, like uh, many countries, let's say, and then in uh, the kind of uh, translates also in the European Union policy is that uh, regulations uh, are very much uh, always or usually delayed within time with the actual developments of uh, technology, uh, artificial intelligence and so on and so forth. So one of the things that perhaps like if you also want to continue innovating, uh, I think Violeta was mentioning yesterday that it's about like the also uh, in organization and also in the legislation. How do we make those things more innovate, uh, innovative and uh, how do we make them catch up with the technological advances that we have? Uh, for example, when we talk about um, uh, kind of self-driving cars, etc. Like, yes, you have the self-driving car first, but then 
uh, if there is no regulation how it's going to be working, how it's going to be like let on, then uh, companies cannot use them, kind of start like uh, uh, trying with them. And, and then, then like, you know, it takes like ages, like, uh, you know, years uh, to see what are we, what is the common ground, how are we going to find it, uh, how is it going to be operated, uh, is it going to be a person that is going to be remotely controlled, et, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, first of all, I think uh, when we talk about development of products, development of services, then it needs to be do it, done like hand in hand with the development of the policies and regulations that are going to be, uh, you know, allowing those technologies to be used in a daily day life. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, so yeah, this was just to show that uh, despite uh, the, the cover of the global index having uh, flags of the, of the countries, of the nations, the European level, we have this dichotomy sometimes between the Union and, uh, and, uh, and its countries <laughs> involved. Okay, but moving on, uh, we still have some time left, and in a, in a short while I'll give the floor to some of the questions. Uh, as a last point, Leonardo, for instance, and um, talking about talent attraction, talent retention, not just in, in Estonia, but in, in general. Um, so you work in a specialized state agency that uh, amongst other things also focuses at uh, branding the country, uh, empowering it as you put it also in your presentation. But how important are, and of course you will tell that they are, <laughs> but, uh, but how important in general are having specialized agencies in order to brand, to empower a place or a city or a country or a community? Like, if there is substance behind, as, a, as, we, all, as, as we also spoke yesterday about the green solutions, if there is substance behind, uh, be it uh, so-called green policies, uh, green solutions, etc., be they in Latin America, be they in Europe, if there is substance behind, uh, do we really even need this help from branding agencies? Li like, or, or you know, can we do away without them? I, I know what is your answer and what it should be, but just like uh, food for thought, and also perhaps to Glenn. Yeah, no, um, uh, I would say that uh, actually, I mean, yes and no, right? Like, for example, uh, taking the context of uh, um, Berlin, everybody knows Berlin, everybody would like to maybe like live in Berlin at some point. Uh, uh, but they also have their own talent attraction, like uh, uh, management, like strategy. So on that sense, they, uh, it is needed. Why it is needed? Not, not, not because you know, they don't have enough talent to be attracted uh, to that uh, city, but because they want to manage it properly, right? They want to create different areas uh, that perhaps you know, they are attracting the wrong talent, right? Uh, and overall, I don't think that uh, the organizations and the different uh, kind of branding areas that, that we have at the, at the government level aren't, uh, you know, are not like intrinsically like necessary. If we would, you know, be attracting the businesses, if we would be attracting the startups, etc., everything would be working fine. Then, yeah, we wouldn't need, for example, that much like manpower behind it. Like we would perhaps only need one person managing the website in order to receive applications, for example. And then, uh, ideally, yes, uh, we would lose the whole work in Estonia program, but just to keep like the website, then because people are coming already like uh, on their own, right? But uh, unfortunately. There, there is a need at the moment because the companies are struggling, right, to find this talent. Uh, the countries are also struggling to enter the market. Uh, the different uh, industries are struggling to find the competent talent, the competent partners, in order to continue that growth development. There is more demand than the actual supply in those different areas. So until there is this demand, until there is this uh, mismatch of you know attracting the talent, this mismatch of attracting the businesses, then the need for this sort of uh, helping, supporting agencies uh, that help you like navigate, that help you like provide you with the tools, etc., uh, will exist. Uh, and, and and at the moment, I think uh, we are unfortunately also nowhere closer that we're going to have to you know like uh, put our legs up and say like oh our job is done. Uh, I would like to do that, and we would like to do that. <laughs> 
Uh, and I think every country would like to do that, you know, like put the legs up and saying like, you know, it's working, everything is flawless. Uh, but uh, it is a problem that at the moment it's not, and with more competition, uh, with uh, countries uh, fo looking for the same uh, resources, fighting for the same talents, then uh, I don't see this as closely like to, uh, to ending. But again, uh, when we're talking about uh, this competition, if we can manage to find collaboration that helps everybody win, that helps these uh, different like, companies uh, get the same talent, different countries bringing in money and then uh, finding their own like uh, DNA, as we call it, or value proposition, uh, if that all works fine, then there wouldn't be a need for those uh, supporting organizations, or their role will be very much like diminished. And that definitely should be a goal on its own, right? Where we want these companies, uh, uh, sorry, when we want these organizations to not exist anymore because there is no need, because everything works flawlessly. But unfortunately, I think it's it's uh, years ago, you know, later on that will happen. Okay. Um. How do you how do you measure the success of a, of a branding? Uh, how do you measure the results of the branding process? Yeah, now you sound like my stakeholders. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's different ways to measure, right? Like yes, I, as I mentioned that, uh, and, and in, in marketing it's kind of difficult. Uh, you, you know, you see more people coming into Estonia, for example. Uh, but uh, we don't ask each and every one of them, like, did you come thanks to the Work in Estonia uh, promotion or the, you saw an ad or you saw the video that we did, right? Uh, but uh, that is one way to measure the visits that we have to the website, uh, the number of applications that we received in the website, uh, the amount of people who participated in our events and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, the way we measure it is uh, we look at these indices, indexes, for example, how is the brand of Estonia perceived more and more like uh, when, when I go to different conferences, like then I understand like if people, you know, have some associations uh, with Estonia, are they positive, are they negative? Uh, and then also uh, we look at... Um, in addition to the metrics of the of uh, of the of the website, then uh, we look at the, uh, at the feedback, right? When people are coming over to Estonia, then we ask them, like, you know, are the things that you're expecting are is, are the things that are happening in Estonia, right? And then uh, look at the net promoter score if they would recommend to a friend, uh, customer satisfaction, if they are happy with the services that we provide, and so on. So it's a bunch of different metrics because unfortunately we cannot get the very bottom question, yes, like how many people did our campaigns brought, but we just see that because of our campaigns, the companies, for example, are saying that it's uh, very good marketing materials, the companies are saying that it's uh, helpful when they are trying to attract internationals, uh, the internationals are saying that it's uh, helpful, like, you know, going to the International House of Estonia, which is a one-stop shop that we have there that they receive uh, uh, you know, proper services that they did uh, all, a couple of things in one single place. So kind of marketing all those things together is what we receive as the positive feedback. And in as much as we have the positive feedback, then we know that it's working. And of course, again, like even us, we have to maintain these innovation standards, right? Because it doesn't mean that the services that we have been providing for the past five years are the services that we're going to need for the next five years. And that I think that is one of the uh, kind of uh, biggest problems in uh, governmental industries uh, that uh, when we say, oh, it has been this for years, but then actually we have to keep continue questioning, yeah, like the question like, uh, uh, why are we doing this? And this is the same thing that we need as before. And no, it has to be a constant challenge, uh, a constant asking like, well, uh, is this still working? And that's one of the things that uh, we try to do. But yeah, it's up for the companies to decide. Okay, thank you. And uh, the, my last question before the question uh, before the, the the floor to the it, yeah, uh, I will direct you a question. Oh, you want to answer this one? I had another one for you, but okay, please go ahead. Is it, uh, should I? <laughs> thank go you. Ahead. No. Um, Branding is a very volatile thing. I mean, we do crisis management, we do brand reputation, we do reputation management, and so on and so forth at, at Time and Place Consulting. And there's one thing that I've noticed, it's very volatile. Of course, the more institutionalized a country or a company is, um, the more attention it has, but the more of a legacy it has as well. Um, just to give you an example, Germany, even though it's going down rapidly, in many cases still seen as a front runner in industry and, and car manufacturing and so on. 
That is kept. You know that made in Germany actually comes from the Brits after the Second World War. They wanted to make sure that everybody knew that the steel products from Germany were of less quality than the British ones. That kind of backfired. But that's the kind of volatility that brand strategy has, or brand um, or reputation. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight, and exactly uh, two things actually. The, the first thing is that you don't know yet what you're going to need in five years, or you are working on it to know what you need in five years, but it's not yet there. And that's the kind of um, development. It's a biological thing. It keeps working, it keeps growing, it keeps developing, it keeps changing. Um, we are right now focusing a lot on, on, on Europe in, in the discussion, but um, you know, when you look at the Belt and Road Initiative of China and the impact it's having across the globe, and there have been discussions where I've known that investment from China, you don't want that, but now all of a sudden there is acceptance for it because there's no alternative for one. That has an impact on brand, just, you know, just an example. The second point is the public-private partnership that exists at all levels. Um, for industry and government to work together, it needs a certain level of mentality, um, of course, which dictates the amount of partnership there is. Um, one thing that we've seen in Europe that has been quite successful is the implementation of these kind of public-private partnerships which are publicly funded but allow for new innovative technologies, things to try and catch up with, with the US, for example, when it comes to the digital market. The point here is that the mind has to be kept open about how government and business work together because that is the element of inclusion. I'm not saying that government should be dictated by business because there's a different responsibility that government has. Is that uh, a score or is that 10 minutes to go? <laughs> um, sorry, jokes aside, but uh, this, this is the thing and this is also though very much the cultural difference. I mean, in, in Germany, having trade unions, industry and government sit together at the table to discuss is, is part of the way things work. And that's the way public and private partnerships manifest themselves, but differing on different cultures. But again, the two points being, it's very volatile, it's changeable, something can switch completely very quickly, so very quickly. And uh, obviously, I mean, I'm going to say that there is a necessity for um, business and, and government to work together also in the future, as you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Leonardo. Uh, we have 10 minutes to go. Uh, that was another score. That's 10 minutes ago. Uh, yeah, so that was a little bit of a summary of uh, of, of Europe. It was a bit Europe-centered, but perhaps still for our, it's interesting to also combine this side since uh, we have here a delegation coming from the, the other side of the Atlantic. So, any questions, any observations from the audience to our two speakers? Yes, there is here one. Over there. Ah, uh, Ella. <laughs> I, uh, let's get the, to change a little bit this discussion. I'm putting like a spicy answer, uh, question. How about the war? What's happening right now? How can I solve this looking for the soft rest on several pillars? If you look for the government, it's, I think it's a big problem in the soft power, to, like to cut the soft power. They, they used to have a, a, a hard power instead of soft power. So how can you put inside this whole, whole discussion the government? Yeah, well it's, it's, uh, thanks for the question and it's a... Uh, it's a difficult thing, right? Like uh, it's uh, kind of reminding me of uh, uh, when you are at school and you have kids, and then you say like you know, uh, you try to use the words, you know, you tell the other kids, so you know, you never hit the the kid next door, and then you know you try to build these like uh, rules, etc., and you know this soft power, and then comes the bigger bully kid, and then hits, and then what do you do, right? Like uh, would you try to still continue the, the conversation and say you know like let's use words, etc., while the other guy is like hitting you, like. So, um, unfortunately, in the world like we live in, just like uh, uh, sometimes this uh, soft power, let's say, it's uh, it's difficult to apply, right? Uh, 
in the case of the war. Uh, one of the things that the European Union, including Estonia, is doing is uh, putting a lot of sanctions, uh, closing borders, etc., in order to uh, try to kind of kind of mitigate that uh, very big uh, and without you know at the same time avoiding a bigger conflict. Uh, so that's kind of one way that it's continuing to do. Right? Is it enough? Is it uh, kind of meeting its ends uh, uh, or marking its goals. We don't know yet. Uh, it doesn't seem, you know, because it, we thought that the conflict was going to last maybe a few months, etc. And now it's been like already like more than a year. So, so yeah, the, the question is like very difficult, right? And it's very uncomfortable because we were talking about soft power, but at the same time we have some hard power that is showing also its strength uh, in the world that we live in. So, uh, overall, I think... Uh, uh, it's still like uh, the soft power. Uh, it has like a lot of like influence, uh, uh, but uh, but sometimes we have to like also you know find the balance uh, between the other one. Yeah. Was was the question also directed to me? Just wanted to make sure for both of us. And then I asked the question: Which war? Because there's always been a war somewhere. Uh, we have at the moment several wars ongoing. I mean, we've had the war in the India-China border that has determined the relationship between the two, but not necessarily. We've had uh, the question of Taiwan, which is not yet a war, but it's certainly a build-up and a different form of war because there are other levels of, of conflict going on. Are we, we can talk about the Ukraine war. We can talk about the war against Corona. We can talk about the war in Israel right now, which is creating extraordinarily uh, big dichotomies within Europe. I mean, if you really follow the news, the amount of attention, and this is also the point that I was making before, I don't know if you were here for the, for the presentation, uh, hard power is just a thing of, na it's natural. It's, it's, uh, when you look at history, we'd like to believe that it's not necessary, but it will always be necessary. But it's never the standalone thing. Hard power and soft power, and what I like to call empower, um, these, are, uh, these are things that will always coexist, but at different levels. And we're only, as I we're only able to be as good and as kind as the context allows us and as we behave and try to make the best out of it, and hence the point of empower. Yeah, there's another one over there. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation and the interesting discussion. Um, bringing back to our scenario, where do you think that the Brazilians, we can add value, innovation, um, uh, perhaps some soft power to the European community. For example, we have a great IT developers and people uh, outsource here that look for, what, what kind of other value do you think that we can contribute to the European community in collaboration and, and so forth? Thank you. So uh, yeah, I was uh, I was thinking. I think even before uh, before the question about that, and uh, I I think I'm gonna do, do the same word that I that I can't remember. Like that's one of the things, right? Because uh, when we talk about let's say uh, talents, then uh, we're looking or one of the things that employers are looking the most uh, nowadays. Uh, it's not uh, you know based on CV, but it's based on skills. And one of the main skills uh, that we are looking for is problem solving, right? And uh, here again, like the more problems you have, then the more you are actually likely to solve like this, uh, you know, look for solutions to these problems. So I think like uh, <laughs> uh, in Latin America, in my home country, Mexico, et cetera, in Brazil, you have, uh, you have tons of problems, right? So uh, looking how to solve these problems is one of the things that you can bring to, you know, like uh, Europe, for example, which, you know, perhaps Europe thinks again that they don't have like that many problems, but when you look at it, it's like, you know, why do you have it like this? You know, why can't you do it this other way? So bringing that sort of creativity that you have uh, into uh, the everyday solving problems and applying them to bigger uh, issues, bigger problems, bigger context, that can be one of the things that the uh, Brazilians have this uh, added value. Uh, it's, it's my first time in the country. It's my first time here in Rio. So it's uh, uh, kind of like hopefully at the end of the week, maybe I have like more things uh, to say. But... Uh, definitely, that would be one of the things that I would like to, to stress. Thank you. Um, it's my third time in Brazil, and as mentioned, we have colleagues working here, um, Tatiana being one of them. She's actually inspired me a lot when it comes to understanding Brazil better. I cannot 
name now all the resources that Brazil has, the IT expertise. I mean, traditionally, it's, it's been the conversations about biofuels. That changed very quickly in Europe. There's been the conversation about agriculture. That scared a lot of Europeans. There's been the question about skills and seeing from other countries in the IT sector. That scared, because, uh, scared off the Europeans. The one thing I find, and again, coming back to what I've become inspired to, is, is the enthusiasm for transformation, the enthusiasm for change. And I think this is something that uh, the score is going down. Now we went from a 10 to a 3. Uh, so uh, what, what's ex I find the most valuable asset, at least the one I can see, is this joint ability to work together and have that ambition. And again, I, the trade deal, I say, is a little bit outdated. It's bilateral instead of being multilateral, as trade deals should be, in my view. Um, I, I see that ambition to move forward in, a, in the e-mobility agenda. I see that ambition to take chocolate bars of pharmacy shelves. I see that ambition to um, move ahead with implementing United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And that, I think, is the biggest asset that, that I see for the moment. I, I'm very happy to be taught differently or, you know, learn. So uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Yeah, we saw three minutes um, one minute ago, so it like leaves us two minutes. Uh, any quick question or we wrap it up? Yep, I think we can wrap it up. So thank you very much, Glenn. Thank you very much, Leonardo, uh, for the interesting discussion, for your presentations, and thank you for the audience for, for having uh, interest and listen a bit about the European continent. Yep, thank you.